Okay. Hi, welcome and good evening. My name is Eric Hartman. I'm the executive director of the Haverford College Center for Peace and Global Citizenship. We're really thrilled to be uh, hosting this event this evening. And we're going to do a lot of learning together as we, um, as we proceed here, learning about some walking tours in Philadelphia and their history right before the uh, pandemic and their aspirations for operating after the pandemic. Well, again, thanks for being here. And I'm just gonna say a little bit about the individuals who will be presenting uh, or introducing a reflection. So the reflection is gonna start with uh, Siobhan Lyons, who is the president of Citizen Diplomacy International and a Philadelphian for 15 years, uh, coming here by way of Ireland and some background with the Irish Aid Program. So a great deal of global development uh, experience. And every time I've spoken with Siobhan, we've had, or I've experienced hearing wonderful reflections. Um, so she'll say a bit. Before the event here with Imran Siddique and Amina Gafar Kusher, who, uh, Imran is the communications director with Black Star Projects and a collaborator with the South Asian American Digital Archive. And Imran and Amina have worked together on supporting um, SADA, the South, the South Asian American Digital Archive. And uh, also Amina has developed some curriculum that can connect that walking tour with uh, K-12 schools. So before uh, handing the mic over to Siobhan, I just wanted to mention that the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship at Haverford College really has a 20 year history of looking at local and global intersections and inter interactions with injustices. And part of that, of course, is understanding the local places we inhabit and their complicated histories. So we're really excited to be hearing from the presenters today. We're also co-sponsoring with the Community-Based Global Learning Collaborative, which deeply appreciates community held knowledges and amplification of knowledges and insights that don't necessarily always originate on campuses and are often kind of embodied in the structures and places of, uh, in this case, the cities and communities and histories um, off campus. And finally, PACI, the Pennsylvania Council for International Education, really supports access to excellent global education for all Pennsylvanians. And part of that must be better understanding the really nuanced, complicated, intersectional history of Pennsylvania, uh, which is inevitably quite more complicated than the dominant narrative ever reveals. So with that, I'm just thrilled to listen in. And I'll say in the brief moments of introduction, it's um, before everyone logged on, uh, so apparent that we all have a great deal to learn from connecting with each other. So I look forward to that happening in the question period as well. So Siobhan, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, um, Eric. So good evening, everybody. Um, Ahorja, friends. My name is Siobhan Lyons and I am an Irish immigrant to Philadelphia. On this eve of St. Patrick's Day, it is my great pleasure to join you all for this special program on the links between the Irish and South Asian communities in my adopted hometown. I am the president and CEO of Citizen Diplomacy International. We're an international relations agency that connects Philadelphia to the world by creating opportunities for mutual international exchange. But I'm also an immigrant rights advocate. I chair a political action committee called Second Generation that seeks to upend the current political system by supporting diverse and progressive candidates from immigrant communities. Right now, we are supporting a handful of South Asian candidates, among others. So when Eric reached out to talk about revolution in Philadelphia, and the ties that bind post-colonial communities, I was utterly delighted. Philadelphia is, of course, the birthplace of the United States of America, but it also played a critical role in Ireland's fight for freedom from the British, serving as home to Joe McGarrity, the founder of the Philadelphia branch of Clan Gale, the largest single financier of the Easter Rising in 1916. Irish nationalism has always had an international flavor, so it's no surprise that Joe McGarrity and Roger Casement, a hero of 1916, were also supporters of the Hindu-German Conspiracy, a series of plans by Indian nationalists to overthrow the British during World War I. Roger Casement himself came to Irish nationalism through his experience in the British colonial service, where he investigated the inhumane treatment of native workers in the Belgian Congo and the Amazon. 
Um, he was a diplomat and also a revolutionary. And so he's one of the people that I aspire to look, you know, to, look to as an example. Um, Ireland often served as a testing ground for policies that were later implemented in other colonies. So to an Irish Republican, the connections between the injustices of empire in Ireland and those in India were obvious. This remained the case even after we achieved independence. Following the formation of the Irish Free State in 1922, the Irish set about supporting India's fight for freedom, establishing the Irish Indian Independence League in 1932, with a view to work by every possible means to secure the complete independence of India and Ireland, and to achieve the closest solidarity between the Irish and the Indian masses in their common struggle against British imperialism. Today, in my modern Ireland, that sense of kinship remains. If you ever visit Dublin, um, and Saint, which is my hometown, and you visit St. Stephen's Green, which is a beautiful park right in the centre of the city, you will find a bust of India's Nobel laureate, Rabindranath Tagore, the Bard of Bengal. This is a gift from the Indian government, and it is the only statue of a non-Irish person that has ever been placed in St. Stephen's Green. And it puts a smile on my face every time I see it. I have always been fascinated by the way in which intercultural dialogue and interactions create new ways of seeing the world. The statue of Tagore at the centre of Dublin is one of those moments. It reminds me of Ireland's place in the world and helps me see my country's past through a new lens. And now, thanks to Amina and Imran, we will also gain a new lens on Philadelphia's revolutionary past and help write the important contributions of our immigrant communities into our city's narrative. I hope you're looking forward to this programme as much as I am. Bamkhti Nafela Porig Urov, happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Thanks, Siobhan, and thanks, Eric. Um, and um, we're delighted to be here with you. I hope you can see my screen. Can I just get a thumbs up so I know that people can see the screen? Yeah, we're good? Okay, great. So um, I, my name is Amina Ghaffar Kucher. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm delighted to be joined here with um, Imran Siddiqui, who is representing Sada today. Uh, even though he's, you know, just, uh, he's a collaborator there, there, but he was the person who actually gave me the walking tour. So he was um, somebody who's very important in the development of this curriculum um, for me. And I don't know if you can see the poll results, but um, we did ask you a question when you joined. Um, and a, less than half of, just about half of you are from Philadelphia. About 29% of you are from outside of, of Philly, but are familiar with historic Philadelphia. 12% are not familiar with historic Philadelphia and are from outside. And we even have a couple of people from outside of Pennsylvania, which is really exciting for us, but it's just giving you sort of a, a range of, of who's with us today. Um, and so we're gonna be talking about Sada's Revolution Remix walking tour and the curriculum that goes with it. Um, so what's gonna happen is that Imran is going to give you an overview of Sada very quickly, and then talk to you a little bit about the Revolution Remix walking tour. And and um, also share one of the stories there that will connect with um, Women's History Month as well. And then I'm going to introduce you to the curriculum and talk to you specifically about um, this, this alliance between the Irish and South Asians in, in 1920s Philadelphia. And then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So with that, I'm just going to um, hand it over to Imran. Hello. Um... Yeah, my name is Imran um, Siddiqui, so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and as Amina mentioned, you know, I'm a collaborator with the South Asian American Digital Archive. Um, SADA creates a more inclusive society by giving voice to South Asian Americans through documenting, preserving, and sharing stories that represent our unique and diverse experiences. Um, it was founded in 2008. Um, and now has more than 3,000 items uh, in its collection. Um, and it's the largest publicly accessible archive of South Asian American history in the country, um, with some items dating back more than 100 years. And this slide just gives you a sense of the various projects that we're doing. And um, you can find more of that info at sava.org. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the, the definition of South Asian America is, is uh, you know, you could ask a, 10 different people and get 10 different answers, but in, uh, Sada believes in a broad conception of, of South Asian America centered on those in the U.S. who trace their heritage to Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, 
and the many South Asian diaspora communities across the globe. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot more information on the site. I won't, I won't tell you more, but I actually wanted to start um, before we talk about the walking tour or as we get into talking about the walking tour, which is one of the projects and one of the ways that South Asian, that Sada um, pursues its mission. I want to start by just acknowledging um, and honoring the occupied land here uh, that I'm in, uh, in Philadelphia, which is uh, and the indigenous people of the land, which is the Lenape people. And um, we do that at the beginning of all of our tours as, as well. And for me, it's not just um, a land acknowledgement, but it's actually core to the purpose of, of Sada's work and the tour specifically. Um, because, you know, the fact that the city was built, Philadelphia, on uh, land stolen by white settlers is one fact which is too often overlooked. Um, and the purpose of the Revolution Remix walking tour is to look at the city through a lens which attempts to fundamentally reframe that dominant narrative or the popular way in which we're taught to think about Philadelphia, the United States, um, and, and you know the histories of, of the West in general. And so um, you know we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the Revolution Remix walking tour kind of um, it attempts to reframe how people look at the city. And so for that reason, uh, it's in the historic district of Philadelphia. And we um, conceived of it originally by, um, you know, we had stories from all across Philadelphia, all the different, there's so many different stories we could tell about the histories of South Asian Americans in this city, but we chose this particular area of the city because um, when you walk around it, there's a lot of um, connotations, a lot of imagery or familiar symbols that might um, make you think of certain uh, stories about the city. And so we're really trying to subvert that with the tour. And so it started um, uh, almost more than five years ago, but we, we started concept conceptualizing it, but it, we began giving public tours in 2018 and all through 2019. And of course, uh, the pandemic interrupted that in 2020. But before that, in late 2019, we um, embarked on kind of a, an expansion of the, of the project, um, which would allow people to experience it even if they weren't there physically in person. So we didn't know what was going to happen with the world, but it, it ended up being um, adept or yeah, useful. So in the late, in late 2019, um, five musicians um, from around the country, uh, South Asian Americans were commissioned to create songs based on the stories which we tell on the Revolution Remix walking tour. And these songs, you can now listen to them um, on the site um, and also will be connected to an audio recording of the whole tour, which um, together, creates a, a completely kind of um, uh, an experience you can enjoy on your own, um, at your own pace. Um, at the end of the, the presentation today, if anyone has any questions about accessing that, um, I, can, I can help you find it. Right now we're still developing or finishing the website for it to be publicly available, but there are ways you can access it um, right away. But the music is already out there. And what uh, Amina was playing at the beginning of uh, today, if you heard it, was one of these songs um, related to the tour. Um, so on the next slide, I'm just going to quickly, it's a map of, of the tour itself. So you can see kind of um, where we go um, in the city. And, and the very first stop at the Liberty Bell, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a iconic, you know, uh, visual. And so we chose that uh, stop intentionally to kind of subvert it. And the story that we tell there is actually the story of, um, that Amina is gonna go into a bit more uh, right after me, which is the story of kind of revolutionary um, Indians in America collaborating with um, Irish Americans on, on a particular march in Philadelphia. Um, and then these other stops, I won't, I won't uh, of course have time to tell you all the stories, but uh, we cover everything from um, boat 
uh, Bose, the founder of Bose Audio, um, who's lived in Philadelphia, to um, all the way at Ray Street Pier, we talk about lost cars, which were indentured workers on British um, and other European ships who, in some cases, jumped ship. Um, and we have some of their stories. Um, so all different kinds of stories covering religion, covering um, uh, various civil rights battles um, that communities within South the South Asian American community have had to fight not only with or against uh, the dominant white communities, but also um, sometimes with and against each other. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated um, story. And, and um, today, I, I don't know if I have time to tell um, the full um, story that I was going to tell, but I want to give you just kind of a, a, a quick um, view into how we do the tour. And so on this map at stop three there, um, there's a there's a little plaque uh, on the corner. And that plaque uh, just kind of briefly mentions the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. And uh, that college happens to be one of the first in the world uh, for women to be able to study uh, Western medicine and, 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 and ultimately get a degree. And we tell that story um, on this tour because um, this photo right here is of a woman named Anandibai Joshi, who actually, um, though is not really widely known in Philadelphia, and we actually often remark that as we walk on the tour, you don't really see any plaques or uh, markers of, of Joshi's life. But um, in fact, she's really one of the most important um, or significant stories we tell in the whole story and really should be widely known um, because Joshi was a woman of many firsts. Um, as far as we know, she was the first South Asian woman to come to Philadelphia. Um, this happened in 1883. And this is three decades before um, the story we'll hear later uh, about the march and, and um, in, in Philly with the Irish Americans. And um, at that time, um, Joshi was only, was one of only a handful of South Asian women in the whole country. Um, and in 1886, she became the very first South Asian woman anywhere in the world uh, to receive a Western medical degree. Um, though I will know 1886 was a big year for that. There was two other women um, who received their degrees later that year as well. Um, but she had she got her degree right here in, in Philadelphia at the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, um, which uh, was started by Quakers. Um, and it originally stood at that corner um, at Sixth and Arch. And as I mentioned, you can still find that plaque um, uh, commemorating where it stood. But the question we really explore in this story, and again, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but it's really uh, about, you know, how is it possible that Joshi did this at that time and at her age? She was actually only 19 years old um, when she came to Philadelphia. Um, and she first uh, arrived in New Jersey um, and was um, taken in by a white American family uh, that hosted her. But before that, she had to go through this whole journey just to get here. Um, you know, it wasn't easy leaving India since she traveled here alone without her family or her husband whom she had married when um, she was just nine years old. So uh, on top of that, there's also issues of, of caste that we go into. You know, Joshi self-described um, herself as, as high, high caste. Um, and, and, you know, um, we tell some other stories of, of, of women who arrived in Philadelphia and, and caste is relevant to who, who got to come here and um, what their experiences were like here. Um, but I'll just read this quote, because um, one of the things that makes this a Sada experience is that we have actual materials in the archive, like this photo um, and the letters that Joshi wrote both to her husband and even in this case, I'm gonna read uh, an excerpt of the admissions letter she wrote um, requesting admissions to the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. Um, it's basically her application. So um, she wrote uh, that determination, that determination 
which has brought me to your country against the combined opposition of my friends and caste ought to go a long way towards helping me to carry out the purpose for which I came, to render to my poor suffering country women the true medical aid they so sadly stand in need of, in which they would rather die for than accept at the hands of a male physician. The voice of humanity is with me and I must not fail. My soul is moved to help the many who cannot help themselves. Um, and again, she was only 19 at that time. She would ultimately graduate, um, become a doctor, but um, in another kind of sign of the times, on her journey back to India, uh, she contracted TB. And by the time she was home, uh, she got really sick. Um, and within three months, um, sadly passed away. Um, so she never really got to, uh, she had a job lined up in India to be a doctor, but it wasn't able to take it on. And you can still see her head headstone. Um, she was actually, her ashes were sent back to the US and you can still find them in New Jersey. And in the Sada archive, you can learn more about Joshi. And so with that, I'll just stop. You know, there's a lot more to say um, about both Joshi and other women, South Asian women who are in Philadelphia. But um, just to give you a, a sense of how, how this connects to the, to the music element of the tour, which we've added, um, I think Amina is going to play a song by Anju, who's one of the artists uh, who was commissioned. And what Anju did is she went on the tour um, actually, sorry, Andrew uses they pronouns as well. So they went on the tour and they um, listened to this story you just heard and then created this song based on um, these stories of women in Philadelphia. Bengals brains, plated brains. Hi, everyone. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to get all the tech stuff to work properly, but I hope you can all hear me and I hope you enjoyed that little excerpt from, from the music. And again, you can um, download everything from, or you can listen to the music from the Sala website, which we'll share with you in a little bit. But Iman, thank you so much for, for um, getting us to this point. Um, and so I'm gonna now talk a little bit about the curriculum that goes with this. And, and that's gonna share the story about the um, Irish and American and solidarity so um, I was asked to develop this curriculum. I was asked to develop a curriculum for the walking tour. And I decided, and, you know, obviously there, there are lots of wonderful stories. Imran just shared one of them. But this first story about how the Irish and the South Asians came together to fight British imperialism really hit a chord with me. And I thought it would resonate with a lot of people, which is why I decided to, to focus on that um, and decided to just use this little bit of history. So just to give you um, some context, we are in, you can imagine just to sort of put us in place, we're in 1920s Philadelphia, um, and there are only 48 states in the United States at the time, so my flag is correct. And South Asia is still under British rule. And so we have what this uh, middle flag signifies. It's the flag of the Viceroy of the Governor General of India. And Ireland was in the midst of gaining independence from the British. So here we have the flag of the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, which changes in um, 1922 to the flag that we, we are more familiar with. So this curriculum is set in 1920s Philadelphia, and the entry points for any teachers who are with us today um, are either US or global history, ninth or 10th grade. And the goal of the curriculum is for students to be able to, un to use their independent learning to recognize and appreciate 
the hidden histories of immigrant groups in, in the United States, thus gaining a more complete picture of immigrant life in 20th century, in the 20th century United States, and a deeper understanding of historical and global connections. So this is just a page from um, the, the actual curriculum, and you can see it's also Common Core aligned and aligned with um, Pennsylvania standards. And it's best suited to use after students have learned something about South Asian partition, even though that happens 27 years after the events that we're talking about. But this lesson focuses up on these events leading to the independence movements of India and Pakistan in 1947. And of course, it can also be used as part of a unit on immigration in US history. Um, so the, the curriculum gets students to really think about the following questions. Um, and we'll start with global history, which is why did Sorry, why did different immigrant groups in the US mobilize against the British against British imperialism? How did local South Asians in the US specifically respond to British imperialism? And also a question about how news traveled in the 20th century, in the first half of the 20th century. Then we can look at US history. Who were the early immigrants in the United States? What did multiculturalism look like in the 19th and 20th centuries? How is it similar or different today? What, what were the relationships like between different immigrant groups? And then also, you know, some questions on, on local Philadelphia history. But ultimately, you know, the curriculum is really asking students to think about whose account of history matters, are counter -narrative narratives necessary and or important. And um, here on the side, this, this is a picture. I have a picture of Joshi, whose story we just um, heard earlier. It's a photo from 1885. And the other two women are two of the other graduates, um, one of them from Japan and one from Syria. So um, quite a little international crew here in Philadelphia in the late 1800s. So in engaging with this curriculum, students will understand that US history is partial and told from a particular pr perspective that glosses over the, pre um, the presence and contributions of immigrants of color, that South Asian Im Americans have had a long presence in the United States dating back to the mid 1800s, that news of the crumbling British Indian Empire in South Asia traveled far and wide and influenced actions in the diaspora as we'll learn today. Several groups were protesting British imperialism in the US and found solid solidarity with one another. And this is where the story of the Indians and the Irish come together. And by the way, I'm using the terms term Indians, but I mean British India, which encompasses a much larger space than what modern day India is. So it includes Bangladesh and um, present day Pakistan as well. And then finally, you know, the final understanding is that Philadelphia was already a really diverse city in the earliest early 20th century. And so I want to give you a bit more context about where we are in this curriculum and tell you a little bit more about these stories. So the Revolution Remix Tour starts by the Liberty Bell and talks about this piece here um, on, on the right here, about how thousands of people gathered, quote, to protest against English barbarities in India and Ireland, and also to register Philadelphia's open recognition of the sister republics of Ireland and India. And so there's this five mile march from the Liberty Bell all the way up to the Knickerbocker, Knickerbocker Theater, which at the time was on 40th and, and Market Streets, which ironically there's an Indian grocery store there now, which I just find really funny. Um, but they were all here to protest the treatment of Terence McSweeney, who had um, recently become the Lord Mayor of Cork, Ireland. And he was on hunger strike to protest his imprisonment by the British um, on accusations of sedition. And so there were several prominent South Asians who spoke at this event. Um, they're quoted here in this piece. You can't see it here because it's very small, but when you download the curriculum, you'll see this page there. And um, there's also a piece in the Philadelphia Inquirer right after the march. And uh, again, it's a little hard to read here, but trust me, it doesn't mention anything about South Asians or anybody else. It does say that, you know, several thousand people were marching and they were protesting um, McSweeney's um, treatment, but they don't actually provide any more information. Uh, and so this is kind of where our curriculum starts. And it's to get students to really think about um, who is missing in these stories and these narratives. And so there are a couple of different tasks that students are asked to engage to really get to the understandings that 
I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to describe some of them to you right now. So the first is what I call um, or what is known as reading text against text. This is where students read those newspaper excerpts from the time period leading up to partition. They compare and contrast the telling of history of these different sources by filling out a graphic organizer, which I'm going to share with you in a minute. After that, the next task is called um, Newswire. And in this, they're asked to rewrite the piece for the Philadelphia Inquirer about giving a more complete picture of what was actually happening um, about the South Asians and Irish people coming together to protest against British imperialism. Uh, another task that students get to do is called restoring the past. And here they're asked to imagine what if the other party had access to social media? Could you create a Twitter, a series of tweets or a social or a Instagram story that um, they could share here um, for, for their US audience. And then finally, the, the final uh, activity is where they listen to Colonizer's Nightmare by hip hop artist Seti X. And then they write a reflection on the connection Seti X makes with other um, US historical events. And as an extension activity, they're tasked with composing their own lyrics that capture solidarity building and immigrant organizing through Philadelphia's history. So if you give me uh, a second, I'm going to try and get um, the sound to work again. I'm gonna play a little excerpt of, of, of this piece. And you'll see again, um, you know, the first piece that we played when you joined us was a little bit more jazzy. That was connecting to Bose and his story. Um, the story about, uh, uh, the story about Joshi that we heard, that music's more like, you know, contemporary kind of folksy pop. pop. And Seti X is using hip hop, um, which is a, really a perfect medium for the story he's trying to tell here. So. Yeah. This song is dedicated to the legacy of the revolutionary gutter party. As we are surrounded by these flawed historical representations of freedom, just remember you are standing on native land. Yeah. I'm a brown skinned rebel with a mind of my own. Displaced by an English colonizer in my home My story's never told, but I'm good though huh. But job to Philly with my people in the hood, bro You see, this American dream is a facade 1927 ain't good, screaming how hard The white man profiteering indigenous land I refuse to be neglected, treated less than a man Now let's get it, scrap with my hands and let it bleed Hope my ancestors see the warrior bloom from the sea Colonizers constantly motivated to breed Tearing down our motherland as if it wasn't safer than I hate it Half of me wants to erupt, the other part wants to stay and find a way to debate it I'm jaded, leave me alone, let me be at peace How can we forget my ancestors chanted down these streets? You and I have never seen democracy, all we've seen is hypocrisy We don't see any American dream, we've experienced only the American nightmare Gives you a little taste um, of the uh, the music, and then students listen to this, and they're asked then to write a reflection and to make connections to the um, other references that Seti X is making in in his music. And of course, you see little you hear little excerpts from Malcolm X's speeches and and other um, uh, speeches as well. So making connections to uh, Black liberation movements as well. So after this, um, this is just giving you an overview of what the lesson plan looks like. And you can see the different entry points that we have here um, and you know the background information and guidelines for teachers as well as the prompts. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there are some graphic organizers that students have to fill out. So they look at these different sources, they're comparing them, they're sort of like these guided questions about, um, you know, the accuracy of these sources, what's missing from them, and really getting students to then supplement this with other materials that are provided in the curriculum. And I'm going to share a, a few of these other documents with you as well. So uh, this is an article that's written after McSweeney's death. He, he, he was on hunger strike. And after 74 days um, in his imprisonment and, and during his hunger strike, he passes away. And um, again, it's a little bit hard to see, but the, there's a quote here and I hope I'm pronouncing his name pro um, properly, but it's Iman de, de, um, 
de Valera, who was the president of, of Ireland or the leader of Ireland, and um, he's quoted in the Gather Party newspaper. And then here on, on the right here is actually an excerpt from Ima de Valera's speech that he gave earlier in the year when he was traveling through the, the United States and was actually raising money and also support for Irish independence. And so he already had this relationship with um, the, you know, the Indian freedom fighters, if you will, um, at that time. Um, so he'd actually been in the United States for 18 months trying to raise the, this um, interest and, and money for, for the cause. So this alliance between the Irish and the Indians was, was really quite well established. And it's fascinating to read about more about McSweeney and just how this mayor in, in Cork, Ireland, um, had such uh, influence around the world. I mean, if you read up about, there were people in, in Barcelona, in Catalonia, in Rome, in Brazil, in, in Nagpur, India, who were all, um, who were all making connections to his, to his hunger strike, to his cause, uh, really an absolutely fascinating character. Uh, so there are a few more documents that students get to read. This is one from the New York Times. Again, it's at the end of the year. It's not painting a very flattering picture about these alliances and things. It's, it's a quite a negative piece. And then here's one a little bit later in the 1930s that, again, is just showing how this movement is, is continuous, continuing to go. And, and you see connections to other groups as well. And also some, some photos um, for, for students to look at as well. So um, all of this is used to supplement their responses in the graphic organizer and to develop a more complete picture of what was going on in Philadelphia at the time. Um, and there are a host of supplementary activities that students can also engage in to try and make more um, contemporary connections. So for example, doing a demographic comparison where they compare the demographics of South Asians in Philadelphia today compared to what we know about them in, in earlier parts of the previous century. Um, and then creating a timeline and looking at sort of other events, significant events or, along the way. They can do a community history of the present where depending on, you know, the diversity of the group that you have in your class, you can have them actually interview elders in their family, no matter where they're from and create a community history um, and learn from that to learn about the personal histories of immigration that shape the city of Philadelphia. And then the other ideas for students to actually create an immigrant museum um, with, with documents, artifacts, bring those stories in for students to, you know, to make those connections and to make all of this history feel a little bit more real. And of course, there's always the walking tour that, that students can, can also engage in. Um, so at the end of the, the lesson, students are asked to complete a learning audit. And I would love to hear from the audience about what you've learned from our little presentation. I think we'll have a good amount of time for some, some Q&A. And uh, you can, of course, learn more information about the curriculum, the walking tour, and, of course, the South Asian American Digital Archives at sada.org. You can follow them on Twitter or Instagram, and the addresses are here. And um, with that, I think we'll just open it up to, to Q&A. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And I do want to encourage everyone to drop in uh, comments or questions in the chat or to just unmute. Um, I think I got Amina's questions correct from the slide, what was verified, what was new, what were misconceptions um, as a prompt. Actually, um, as others kind of think about things I might want to ask, I was wondering, Amina, and I don't know if I mentioned you're a senior lecturer at Penn Graduate School of Education. Um, this just strikes me as amazing. And I wonder if, if we know, I'm trying to imagine my high school experience and how much it would be improved if over the four years of my high school, I would have gotten just any of that content. Of course, I didn't. Um, yet I did, in the last month, I've heard both about uh, world history teachers being pulled out of their classrooms to, to be told not to comment at all on the January 6th insurrection that was that happened. And also I've learned about uh, world history teachers who teach global history in Pennsylvania schools through the lens of the Haitian Revolution. Right? There's so much diversity going on in um, a value judgment might say good and bad ways. <laughs> What's your sense of how much these kinds of complex global histories uh, locally situated are being taken up? 
That is the million dollar question that I do not have an answer to, but I do think that individual teachers who, um, I think there are teachers who find ways to, to use this. I mean, first they have to, you know, the curriculum, they have to have access to the curriculum. That's why this is freely available. Uh, we did have plans to have this whole outreach plan. I mean, that was part of what I was tasked to do. Um, and unfortunately, because of um, COVID, you know, just things just kind of slowed down and attentions were diverted. But I think that still is the idea is to get this into people's hands and to find ways where, you know, because there's so many skills and, and we made sure it was Common Core aligned so that there was no excuse that there are so many ways in which this curriculum can be used. And it really is just two 50 minute lessons. So it's not taking away um, teachers from, from, you know, all the things that they have to cover. Uh, but there are real opportunities here for if, if for the teachers who 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 want to. I think they can. I think it is possible. And I think teachers are always doing things subversively. Um, they just need support from parents and and from faculty and and other people as well. So, um, so I don't know if we don't know. We haven't heard about people using the curriculum yet, just because things really got on hold. Um, and the whole idea of pushing this out because of COVID, unfortunately, was 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 on hold. I mean, this, this curriculum finished last February. We went into lockdown in March. Nobody was thinking about getting curriculum out. People were barely surviving. So, you know, especially for teachers to introduce something like this at that time was just really poor timing. That makes sense. Well, uh, on a positive note, I noted while you were speaking, we have a 20 minute piece we could really just excerpt from this video and share if you're interested uh, through our friends in Pasty because that was a really well put together moment there. Um, Thank you, would love that. Imran, I was curious how people react when they, you know, what you notice in reactions when people do the walking tour, when they do. Yeah, you know, it's it's a wide, wide uh, variety of reactions. We get a wide variety of people who come, you know, it's actually, um, I mean, I was surprised at first because it, it's not, it's probably at least, 50% South Asian Americans, but um, there's a lot of other people who take the tour um, and uh, different age groups. And so we have great discussions on the tour sometimes, you know, people might push back. Um, you might actually see or hear some of the, um, the very things we're trying to challenge that come up on the tour, <laughs> people's understandings of, of history in Philadelphia. So we have very interesting conversations. Um, and then we learn things too. People like Amina or like other um, you know, people with like a lot of knowledge come on the tour and, and actually we changed the tour many times based on um, things that people have given us, stories. Um, one of the best examples is we tell a story about the South Asian Lesbian and Gay Association in New York and, and the march there, uh, for, uh, the India Day march, which they were banned from participating in for many years in the 90s. And somebody on the tour while we were on the tour was like, oh, I was part of the Salga group in Philadelphia. Um, and we didn't know that there was a Salga group in Philadelphia. And so now that's part of the stories that we tell. So yeah, it, it's uh, it's fun to do them. I miss doing them. Um, um, can't wait to get back to doing them, yeah. I was on the tour when that happened. I remember that really, really well. We were in the little church, church stop, I think, where we were telling that story. So I remember that. Imran, there's a question from Abby. And since I don't remember the name of the other woman that you talk about, maybe you could um, share the, the other story. There, there's, um, there is another story that you share. Well, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a couple other women um, who come up on the tour. Obviously there were many, well, there weren't that many women actually. Uh, at that time because of immigration restrictions. Um, but the other story that we tell in depth is of this woman named Pandita Ramabai, who is actually distantly related to Anandi by Joshi. She, she heard about Joshi being in medical school uh, in Philly and she was in uh, England starting uh, her own studies. And so she came to Philly for the graduation of Joshi in 1886 with her daughter I mean, ended up staying for a couple of years and wrote a book about it. Um, and she was um, Christian and, and she writes kind of about her experiences, with different um, really Christian groups in the US. And then, um, but that book that she wrote ends up being kind of the place where the story of Joshi is partially documented or best documented at that time. So that's partially where we pull some of the 
the story of Joshi from is from Pandita Ramalai. Um, but then we also talk about Pandita Ramalai's experiences living in Philly, which are actually kind of funny. There's a lot of <laughs> funny in the way that, um, you know, history can be funny in that people were treated poorly, but in ways that seem absurd, but you learn from them. I don't know. But uh, anyways, I won't tell you the whole story, so, but I can, um, you know, send you, I'm going to share a link here to the, uh, the full audio versions of all the stories, which can be downloaded. Right now they're for sale, um, but if you'd like to, to um, get them for, without paying for them, uh, please reach out to me. Um, I talked to Samit this morning and there are ways we can give you the direct files too. Thank you both. Uh, there's a lot going on in the chat, of course. I do want to ask Siobhan, um, since you do work bringing people together, uh, um, cultural conversations, et cetera, uh, something in the process, and then Imran named it in the course of some of the tours, you know, people push back. But what, I think it was our chat before things started, you were saying you do this uh, migrant inclusion advocacy and sometimes you, you're calling people in. Um, I was just curious, you know, what are your experiences trying to talk to those people who aren't sort of already willing to come into these, what I would express what we're hearing today, more complicated, nuanced understandings of, of where we are in our history? You know, I mean, I think obviously it's it's a mix, you know, I think modern Ireland and certainly Irish born people, um, you know, consider ourselves very much part of, you know, the post-colonial movement and, you know, Ireland was one of the first countries after the United States to break away and, you know, we felt that out from the British Empire and then it was our sort of job to help other countries do that, so we invited a lot of different revolutionaries to Ireland. Um, and, you know, and we see ourselves as very much sort of part of that liberation movement. You know, in modern Ireland, we have a bit more of a conflict over recognizing um, our role in the colonial past, because, you know, obviously many people did serve the British Empire and were also sort of, they were colonizers. We weren't, we were both colonizers and colonized. Here in the United States, um, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, obviously the Irish community, when in the early stages of immigration was sort of more working class and more open to sort of collaboration. I find a lot of the time with the Irish American community now, there has been a disconnect between, um, you know, our immigrant past, you know, it's such a long time ago. If people came over in the, you know, in the 1850s, they're now fifth or sixth generation from, from, you know, their immigrant past. And so they consider themselves Irish, but they've let go of that immigrant. So, you know, I've talked to a lot of different Irish groups and I'll be like, you know, the Irish, um, you know, we were discriminated against when we came here and, you know, and all these things, no Irish need apply, whatever the, the stories are that people like to tell, you know, and that's why we have to reach out and make sure that we can support other immigrant communities to have the sort of saying, you know, we became this one of the most successful immigrant groups to the United States, and we want other immigrant communities to have that same experience, and we should help them. And it's immediate, they're all like, yeah, yeah, go Ireland, you know, we were so oppressed, and we're so great now. And then you're like, and now we should help the Mexicans and the undocumented, and they're like, no, no, we absolutely should not. So, um, you know, you just have to keep on trying. I mean, I think I have a very privileged place because I am from Ireland. So when I get to talk to Irish Americans, my voice has a certain authority. So when I can sort of say Ireland wants immigration reform, um, we have many undocumented immigrants. We see ourselves as aligned with the undocumented community. Um, you know, we have a gay um, former prime minister, currently a deputy prime minister who's also the son of an Indian immigrant. So, you know, Modern Ireland would see itself as more pro-immigrant, you know, certainly uh, we were the first country in the world to vote for um, gay marriage. Um, so, you know, we would see ourselves as much more liberal, in fact, sometimes than the Irish American community. And so, you know, there's some very interesting conversations, I think, to have around inclusion and what it means to belong and what it means to be Irish and what it means to be an immigrant and what it means to be, you know, a hyphenated American. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And of course, there are these moments of clear connectivity, like the San Patricio Battalion, you know, this celebrated moment in the, um, in particular, Mexican-American War. Um, but um, so much systemic racism that uh, 
speaking as a Irish claiming white American, we have we have participated in as well. Um, but in any case, I mostly came back on to say I don't mean to dominate. I wanted to let folks um, just have a moment to pop in other questions um, or comments. It's a great question coming in from Marianne. What, what might you say to teachers in schools who say the curriculum is too political, revisionist, or not for them or their communities? So Marianne is my student. I should let everybody, I feel the need to, former student, feel the need to, to, to let everybody know this. So she's giving me tough questions. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm going to throw this question out. I don't know if there are any teachers in the room. I'm sure you have um, experienced this kind of pushback or conversation. And maybe um, I would just love to hear from, from more people about, um, about this. I mean, I think it's, it's not just teachers in schools. It's, it's also parents who can come in and, and if, be concerned about, well, what are you teaching my children kind of thing. But I feel like the, the facts are right there in front of them um, for, for them to look at. It's not like we're making up. That's one of the nice things about using primary documents is the documents are there for you to look at and to um, use to, to um, examine history in this way. But I'm just curious if any other teachers uh, have any thoughts about this or Imran, if you want to add something to this. I'm, I'm a historian by trade and a former teacher, and I would say this is not, this is, there is no way in which this is revisionist history. This is revealing of the, his, the histories and narratives which weren't currently told. Um, and it's, it's done in a really amazing way. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, all I'll add is that as I was mentioning, you know, we get pushback sometimes on the tour and, and in some cases it's from South Asian Americans, you know, and, and to me it, it underlines how, you know, we ourselves, you know, I went to a public school and public university and learned about the country in the way, you know, I, a majority of people learn about it. And so, you know, I think that's why it's so important. Um, it's not, it's not to say that I mean, there was a time when I didn't know about this stuff. That's what I usually say to people when they challenge me. And so I say, well, you know, I had to learn about this too. It's, and it is uncomfortable sometimes, um, but it's, you know, I, like you said, I mean, it's just, I just point people back to the archive and say, this is, this is a real thing. <laughs> this is not, uh, we didn't make it up. But um, I, I briefly wanted to note before we left that, Part of our inspiration was, and we worked in collaboration with another walking tour in Berkeley, um, the Berkeley South Asian History Walking Tour. So also would encourage folks, they're not um, doing theirs right now either, but there's all these other stories over there and, and histories um, and connections. And the Gutter Party was, of course, very active over there. Um, but yeah, just forgot to mention that earlier. So I wanted to put that in the chat. And, and they just managed to rename a street in Berkeley after um, a, a woman whose name is completely eluding me, Imran. I don't know if you remember the, the name of the person, um, but it's it's still pretty, pretty remarkable um, for that to have happened. So I think we're almost out of time. I don't know if anybody else has any comments or last words or anything else. I'll close with a, um, well, it looks like Siobhan might have something. I just wanted to say, Amina, there's a street in Delhi that's named after Eamon de Valera. It got renamed. Oh, well, look at that. In 2000. Okay. That's uh, amazing. Look at that. That's pretty incredible. Uh, so thank you all. Really wonderful. And, um, you know, the personal being political and historical being uh, personal as well. I'm reminded of my great aunt, uh, Helen. She was born in 1909. Uh, March 17th. Uh, her mother should have called her Patricia because that would have been the tradition for a young Irish girl, but didn't because of the discrimination at the time. 
she got her degree from University of Delaware and was a teacher, but she had to work in Southern Delaware rather than Wilmington because mm -hmm. the discrimination was as it was. It's really interesting. Um, and at the same time, I just wrote with a colleague of ours at Center for Peace and Global Citizenship about uh, systemic racism in Philadelphia, in particular in black and white communities. And the, the influx of Irish was not a good thing for the black community in, in southern, uh, uh, southern Philadelphia at the time that um, Anne Helen was growing up. So thank you for bringing more nuance to our understanding of history in our region this evening. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, have a wonderful day tomorrow if you celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Thanks everyone.